Okay, so uh, our second speaker this morning is Elena Luisa Lang, who's coming uh, here from Zurich. Uh, Elena is a senior researcher and lecturer at the University of Zurich. Uh, after having a career as a recording and performing musician in Germany, she went back to academia. I'm curious about that. Yeah, I will tell you about it. Good. Please. We can just retrieve it. And there's we can just yeah, you can just retrieve it. Yeah. She went back to academia and spent two years in Japan as a PhD student. In 2011, she received her PhD in Zurich with a thesis on Nishida Kitaro, uh, a Japanese philosopher. Since 2013, she's been working on her habilitation on Marx's critique of political economy and its Japanese reception in the 20th century. <coughs> Theoretically, she's close to the Neue Marx Lecture, uh, Heinrich Bachhaus, uh, and uh, the title of her forthcoming uh, monograph is Uno Kozo's Theory of Pure Capitalism in Light of Marx's Critique of Political Economy. And that's coming out with Brill in their HM series next year, right? Is yeah, the, the manuscript, I think, I, I'll submit it next month or so. So it depends on the publisher how long it will take. Great. Well, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of Elena's uh, work, and I'm really happy to meet her. Uh, and uh, her talk today uh, will be Hegel's, entitled Hegel's Contribution to Capital, Essence, and Appearance as Categories of the Critique of Political Economy. Okay, thanks a lot, Nick. Um, I think I'll stand up. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to this conference. I think uh, the, the impetus of this conference is, is, is an absolute, is, is a desideratum, is really desired. We need to reflect and think about dialectics again, and I find it's just, just an irony that the um, Institute for Analytical Philosophy would fund this <laughs> conference in part, um, but uh, yeah, why not? I think we should learn from each other, if we can. So um, my talk will do two things. Um, first, I will show that um, without the concepts of essence and appearance, we will not understand what Marx says and what he does in capital. So saying and doing are often two very different things. I think you've all noticed yourself in your personal life or when you, when you talk to people or your family members. Um, saying and doing are often two different things, but in the specific case of, uh, of Marx's method and of Hegel, and I will talk about the dialectics, this tension between saying and doing or the explicit and the implicit, or the semantic and the pragmatic, it's directly informative of the method they apply. It directly informs the method, this, this, this difference between saying and doing. And I will talk about this uh, in the forthcoming minutes. The second thing, the second objective of my talk is, I, wish, I want to sh try to show, and this somehow relates to what, what Agon said before, that what seems obvious is in fact wrong, and what seems dubious is in fact the only correct scientific procedure. And this is what I call Hegel's contribution to Cabot. So what I want to do in this presentation, I want to revert the title, and I first want to talk about essence and appearance, and then I want to talk about Hegel's contribution um, and the specific dialectic. So since we, since we do not have much time, let's jump right into the deep end and see what Marx's form of presentation in Capital is about. So Marx's main project in Capital is the critique of political economy. That's at the heart of what he does. But what is the critique of political economy? Okay? Um, the critique of political economy is tantamount to the critique of the fetishism of the bourgeois relations of production. This is how he defines uh, what he does, the project in capital. Most famously, this fetish character of the fetishes or the fetishism it generates is presented famously, as you probably all know, in section four of the first chapter of Capital, volume one, the fetish character of the commodity and its secret. And in the literature, there has been a vast literature on this small section. It has been described um, as a practical inversion of the social and the natural properties of things. And this is all good and fine, but I think it's wrong. And I think it's 
it's most of all, it's not the whole story, because there's much more to it. <coughs> the problem of the inversion does not only pertain to the social and the natural properties of things. That would be very easy. But I think more people would have understood what Marx is doing in Capital, but I don't think so many people have understood that. So um, it pertains not only to the fetishism of the commodities, it pertains to, the, um, to all the categories of um, bourgeois political economy. And these categories are not just a commodity. It's money, it's capital, it's wages. All the forms of price, cost price, production price, market price, profits, entrepreneurial profits, commercial profits, interest, ground rent, and so on. These are all the fetishized expressions of um, what's really going on, if you will. They are the categories of classical political economy. And they are all, they have one thing in common. They are all based on a notion of simple and most of all equal exchange as the basis of the capitalist metabolism. They hence disregard, and this is where Marx comes in, as though it were completely arbitrary, the social form of production. Okay, this is the social form of production is what's interesting, what's, what Marx is interested in. So in these categories of classical and, and vulgar political economy, um, as I will explain soon, is, an, is um, an inversion of essence and appearance that becomes so pervasive that it essentially informs the way that bourgeois political economy um, perceives of capitalism and of its own science. So but Marx, what Marx did, he developed a weapon by which to counter these bourgeois fetishisms. And what is this weapon that he developed? So precisely from the critique of the self-contradictions and the tautologies of classical political economy, especially Smith and Ricardo, he developed the labor theory of value at the beginning of capital. So now, I want to say something about the labor theory of value. It has been a very much contested concept in the last maybe 100 years, but again, very much so in the last 30 years, also in the context of, of um, the Rubin School and the Neue Marx Lecture, which is are very problematic, although I hear to them, but they are also very problematic. So forget everything you, you thought you knew about the labor theory of value, because 90% of what has been written about is complete rubbish. Okay? It is not a theory of price. Okay? It is much more. And I would say it forms the key mechanism the labor theory of value forms a key mechanism which allows Marx to decipher the fetishisms of bourgeois political economy of concepts such as profit, interest, and rent. Okay? And that's why I'd like to compare this, this, the labor theory of value to, to you remember these, these, um, these talks about um, espionage in the Second World War, where the Nazis involved these, these, the Enigma machine? Which, which transmitted these um, encrypted codes. And Alan Turing, um, the famous, the great, um, probably the greatest Englishman of all times, he invented uh, a machine by which to decipher um, this, the Enigma machine. Um, and um, I'd like to call, I'd like to make a, um, yeah, a comparison of, 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 of Alan Turing's machine, the bomber, um, with a, a Marx labor theory of value to decipher the fetishisms of bourgeois and uh, of bourgeois political economy. So the question is, but how? How does Marx do it? How does he go and present this this key mechanism, this this um, this heuristic, to decipher these these inverted realities? He made a decisive at the beginning. He made a decisive conceptual distinction, which is directly informative of his labor theory of value, at the beginning of Capital. He says. There is a difference, there is a distinction between abstract and concrete labor. So for Adam Smith, for example, or for David Ricardo, all labor is concrete labor. They therefore have a, a material concept of the labor that directly produces tables, glasses, and so on, because that's always the example that philosophers use, <laughs> tables and glasses, because it's so immediate. <laughs> um, so they might have a material concept of labor, but they don't have a social concept of labor. And hence, they ignore what is specific about the capitalist mode of production. For them, as you know, it's an eternal form of production, and there's no difference between capitalism, feudalism, slavery, and so on. So, um, 
So they ignore what is specific about the capitalist mode of production, and that is the social form that labor assumes. In the labor theory of value, concrete labor is manifested only in the commodity's use value, that what I do with the thing. But it's, as such, it is clearly distinguished from the social substance of value, which is abstract general human labor. And only the latter, in exchange, um, um, by being exchanged, oh, I should be very careful how I formulate this, um, it, it, it value is uh, the product of this abstract general human labor, and by being exchanged, that labor is realized in certain quanta of money. But this is the specific so social form that labor assumes. And Marx also addresses the magnitude of value. This is expressed in the socially necessary labor time in the average, that is the abstract labor needed to produce a commodity, commodity in the average. So he has a substance concept and he has a quantity, a magnitude, a concept of magnitude. But what is really decisive, decisive about abstract labor is that it never appears as such. You cannot find abstract labor anywhere. You cannot measure it with a watch. And this is where the problems begin, but this is also where the interesting uh, theory begins. Because for essence, that is abstract labor, to appear, it, to speak with Hegel, of course, for essence to appear, it must attach itself to specific forms of appearance. And these are quite distinct from the essence on which they are based. So abstract labor of value can therefore never appear as value, only as the forms of value or the value forms. And these are precisely the categories of bourgeois political economy. They are the commodity, they are money, capital, wages, profit, price, interest, and rent, and so on. In these value forms, and I should add here that uh, at least in the English-speaking world, um, even the, the most prestigious Marxist philosophers, they don't understand what the value form is. Uh, you know, I asked Chris Arthur the other day, who's a, quite a famous, he wrote a book on, on Hegel's dialectic and Marx capital. He, doesn't, he could not give a definition of the value forms. This shows how, how, in, how, how complicated the matter seems to be when it's so, I think it's quite straightforward. So he says, uh, in these, I say in these, in these value forms, the relation to labor, it becomes obfuscated. We do not longer see what money, uh, capital, somehow profit, price, interest, and so on, have to do with labor. So, and it is crucial to note the dynamic of this obfuscation, which Marx follows in the exposition of capital, that it increases from the simpler to the more complex form forms of value and to more, accordingly, to more complex forms of obfuscation. So it's crucial to note the dynamic of this obfuscation. Uh, it, it increases from the simpler to, so it, the simpler would be the commodity. You can still quite see what the commodity has to do with the, um, with production and labor, but it becomes more difficult in money and find it totally impossible and incre incomprehensible in the category of interest-bearing capital, where Marx says the mystification is complete. So we therefore find an increasing obfuscation of abstract labor in the economic categories. Each step more perfectly obscures the origins of production and with it exploitation. The ultimate aim of the labor theory of value for Marx therefore is to disclose the fetishistic forms of value and ground them in abstract labor, to go back to the problem of ground, as the common nexus to show the appropriate appropriation of alien and unpaid labor exchanged without an equivalent. So, but bourgeois political economy sticks fast to the value forms. It sticks fast to exchange between workers and capitalists as equal exchange in money, which seems to prioritize no party involved in, in the exchange. And the essence obfuscated by the value forms must remain a structural blind spot. And this is also why the crucial, which is really the crucial thing, um, um, is, to, is to differentiate between value and the value forms. And it's the original sin, I would call it, of, of bourgeois political economy and some of his Marxist theorists of, of today, that they conflate value and the value forms. You cannot conflate essence and appearance. Well, you can do it, but then you're wrong. So. Um, 
But what follows, I come to part two now, Hegel's contribution, what's, what has Hegel got to do with this? A lot. <laughs> um, but what follows from this critical function of the labor theory of value for the status of Marx dialectic? So among the various attacks on the labor theory of value, a substantial one comes from the so-called new or systematic dialectic. As I mentioned, Chris Arthur earlier, but there's only also Tony Smith and Gerd Reuton. They argue that Marx's categories and capital were homologous to those of Hegel's logic. Okay. Maybe you can prove it, maybe you cannot. This is not the interesting part. Now the interesting part comes. They say that Marx's labor theory of value was faulty because it was introduced too early or prematurely by Marx. You know, it's already in the at the fourth page of the, of the text of Capital where Marx um, provides his definition of the labor theory of value. And they say, therefore, you, they can, Marx cannot prove the labor theory of value. It seems dubious to put it in this position of the text. But as I said in the beginning, what seems dubious is in fact the only scientific way to proceed, and what seems obvious will, so, will show to be wrong. So first of all, the objection that the labor theory of value cannot be proven at the beginning of capital is a very strange one for a Hegelian to make. Yeah? Uh, um, this is because the re relation between presupposition and position or positiveness, Voraussetzung and Setzung, has been implicitly and explicitly thematized by Hegel at the beginning of the logic in the relation of being and nothingness, um, as you all probably know. In his introduction to the science of logic of 1812, uh, Hegel shows why there is, there is no such thing as a pure presuppositionless beginning. In fact, the demand for a pure beginning, as the new dialectic demands, very positivistically, that has nothing to do with Hegel. It is not only impossible to, 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 put, uh, to, to hypostasize a, a pure beginning, but it's more than that, it's indicative of an ideological or even fetishistic thought. So Hegel sensed this somehow already in his time, and therefore he indirectly thematized the dialectic of immediacy and mediation at the beginning of the logic. And this is what he says. So bear with me, it's a long quote. There will be one more quote. <laughs> um, here the beginning is made with being, which is represented as having come to be through mediation. A mediation which is also a sublating of itself. And there is presupposed, presupposed pure knowing as the outcome of finite knowing of consciousness. But if no presupposition is to be made and the beginning itself is taken immediately, then its only determination is that it is to be the beginning of logic, of thought as such. All that is present is simply the resolve which can also be regarded as arbitrary that we propose to consider thought as such. So note that Hegel speaks of the arbitrary character of the beginning. The category of being cannot by itself deliver the justification for why it marks the beginning. It's totally arbitrary. After all, well, it seems to, there seems to be a certain rationality to, 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 to being, pure being. Um, it seems to be a pure concept. But you know what can be more abstract than being nothingness? But this claim will show itself to be false. Being, like abstract labor, and I'd like to, to compare that, the beginning of the logic, the beginning of, 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 uh, the, of capital, is not a pure concept. It requires the whole and total exposition of the analysis as its own premise. In both concepts, the totality of conceptual thought, that is the analysis of the capitalist of mode of production in Marx's case, is presupposed. To understand this, however, like why for being the whole conceptual apparatus of the logic is presupposed, we must shortly digress to an outline of the theory of dialectics. Um, this, in my view, should inform any kind of dialectics worthy of the name. Um, so I want to go back to talk about this, 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 this explicit and the implicit, and the saying and the doing, and, and, the, and the presupposition and the position in the concept of being and of abstract labor. So there's something like a semantic presupposition in being in abstract labor. Why should we start our exposition with being? Why with abstract labor or the labor theory of value? So pragmatically, on the pragmatic level, on the explicit level, we must presuppose the whole analysis to understand the meaning. In this context, the Hegelian scholar Dieter Wandschneider, uh, who wrote um, 
probably the most important book on Hegel's dialectics in 1995. It's called An Outline of the Theory of Dialectics. He speaks of the, pro of, of the semantic and pragmatic cleft of the categories of Hegel's logic. And he says, I'm going to split this up in, into two quotes because it's long, but bear with me for the moment. He says, for a theory of dialectic, two aspects seem to be of fundamental significance. On the one hand, the view according to which every logical category, with the exception of the final determination, contains a semantic pragmatic dis discrepancy, semantic pragmatic discrepancy. It consists in the fact that the explicit meaning of a category does not express all that is implicitly, implicitly presupposed for its meaning. That this must be the case immediately makes sense since in order to explicate a particular meaning, the whole apparatus of logical categories and principles must be presupposed. So it doesn't matter which concept you want to define. If you want to define a concept like the city, what does city mean? The city of Prague. You need, in order to explain what city means, you need a whole conceptual apparatus, which you must presuppose in order to be able to explain what city means. So no matter where you come from, from which angle you come, there's always something presupposed. And he goes on, and he goes on and says, this tension between the semantic content and that which is pragmatically presupposed for the argumentative acts that precede it necessitates the introduction of categories by which this pragmatic surplus meaning, all that is presupposed for understanding a particular concept, uh, is further semantically ex explicated, also diminished, you know, because the more concepts we, we, we have gathered and understood, the smaller the difference between the semantic and the pragmatic becomes. In other words, the semantic <coughs> pragmatic discrepancy contained in a cat category which under specific conditions can be exacerbated to a performative contradiction, as you know, being is not nothingness, is a performative contradiction, makes the necessity to introduce ever new categories plausible as long as the pragmatic surplus meaning remains. And um, that he's, he's talking about two significant aspects. The other aspect of fundamental significance for a theory of dialectics is the role of negation as a self-referential negation introducing the antinomic structure, but I will not talk about this. This, this leads too far. Um, in short, I come to the close now. In short, the semantic pragmatic cleft at is, is the drive at the heart of the dialectics. This discrepancy between the semantic, the meaning, and the pragmatic, all that is presupposed for meaning to be conveyed, um, this is the dialectic of, of presupposition and position accordingly also informs the critical objective of Marx's project in Capital. Marx, like Hegel, was very well aware that there is no such thing as presuppositionless thought. Like Hegel, Marx knew that the starting point of the exposition must always already be mediated by heavily burdened conceptual pres presupposition. But the point for him was not to deny, not to deny, that the pivotal concepts come with all this pragmatic baggage. On the contrary, the point for him was to show that the idea of a pure exposition is necessarily accompanied by an ideological fallacy. And what is this ideological fallacy of a pure exposition? That is something that bourgeois economy epitomized in the notion of simple commodity exchange. Every English economist starts, even today, even the, even the, even the, the neoclassics, they start with the individual metho method methodology of simple commodity exchange. This is not how capitalism works. Yeah. But nevertheless, Marx also starts from this point. He starts from this point to show that it is false. That is not the correct way to proceed. And um, you can say that, that all the ideological implications of, of, of um, economics, let me say economics, they derive from this very idea of simple commodity exchange. But Marx, um, he had this, um, a remedy for this, also related to your value, but also in the mode of presentation, and I will end with this last little long quote uh, from the Grundrisse, where Marx says that an analysis of the specific form of the division of labor, of the conditions of production, which address of the economic relations of the members of society within which these relations are dissolved, which show that the whole system of bourgeois production is implied so that exchange value can appear as a simple point of departure on the surface, 
and the exchange process as it presents itself in service. Simple circulation can appear as the simple social metabolism which nevertheless encompasses the whole of production as well as consumption. And we can see things um, um, are, uh, seem very different uh, from, from the reality. So um, I think I want to stop here because I think I already said uh, most things and um, just at the end because why did I put to you to read the last chapter of Capital? I could have given you the last chapter uh, of the logic, absolute idea, it would have been more or less, more or less the same thing because I wanted to show you where this all ends in, what, what the interesting, what the cognitive gain of Marx's position is. He wanted to show that in the chapter on the Trinity formula, um, the fetishization of wages, profit, and ground as the three sources of wealth in the theory of Adam Smith and so on, we can understand why and how the labor theory of value is the secret to the fetishism of the value forms of which equivalent exchange is its first superficial appearance. And I think this is precisely the strength and not the weakness of both Marx and Hegel's anti-dogmatic positing of presuppositions that characterizes their dialectics. Thank you very much.